right? Um, thanks. Um, all right, so my talk starts with the temporal coding hypothesis. This idea that the precise timing of a spike matters. The thing is that if the timing of a spike matters, then when I learn, when I adapt my code to the environment, this timing should change. Simple idea. The main argument here, it's a very simple one. Imagine that they have two neurons, and they fire and they trigger a spike in a third neuron. If this is repeated very often by synaptic plasticity, the wires become stronger. If they become stronger, I only need one of the, one of the spikes. One comes before two, therefore my neuron fires faster. It's very simple stuff, you'll find it in even some textbooks. Uh, I think the one by Wolfram Gessner on neural dynamics has that example. Um, but I basically want to build that into a theory of how coding and predictions emerge. Uh, those are the neural level um, notions that you need. First, that a postsynaptic spike kind of moves forward in time. So if a neuron gets spikes from many other neurons, it fires and then the spike moves forward in time. Second thing, um, you should not have spikes that appear spontaneously. That's the classical problem that you'll find in many papers about um, synaptic plasticity rules being stable. That means that when my spike moves away, it should not be that all the previous spikes that do reinforce should generate another one, uh, fairly standard. The third one is a bit trickier. The idea is that imagine that a neuron fires twice, and then the two postsynaptic spikes move forward in time, and at some point one saturates and they kind of become close. Now the thing is that this synaptic plasticity, it weakens everything that happens after a postsynaptic spike and it reinforces everything that happens before. So the guys that are in the middle, the presynaptic spikes that arrive in between, um, they, are re they are weakened by this guy and reinforced by this guy. And if this guy wins, the other one dies. So basically, late postsynaptic spikes kind of disappear when they are close. Um, all right, so this is on a very short time scale. This we're talking about like neurons. That means 10, 20 milliseconds. Uh, but humans typically care about seconds, at least. Um, so to do that, you have to basically consider neurons as some kind of random uh, processes. So basically, I have now a population of neurons, and each one of them gets some random, in, some random spike train. Um, now, the first time this spike train is presented, my neuron doesn't have any particular distribution of the weights. Therefore, it just fires kind of randomly with the condition that it has a refractory period. So you get this nice differential equation. Um, it has a delay, but it actually has a solution details in the poster later. Um, and it basically has like an initial peak and then a kind of st stable firing. The thing is that when this neuron learns, so when the same input spike train is repeated very often, the neuron kind of moves its postsynaptic spikes into the future, uh, into the forward in time. So it advances them farther and farther until they are all at the beginning and then the later one tends to disappear. So in the limit, when I put the same input over and over again, I get something that is for the physicist among you like radioactive decay. Basically every neuron has kind of a probability of firing and when it fires it doesn't do it again. So you get this exponential decay, kind of, um, it's relatively easy to get that. Um, all right, so this was all very mechanistic. The important question is why, do, why would we care about this? And the answer is that it kind of makes your code better. The thing is that when you learn, your neurons kind of have less spikes, right? Because the later ones disappear. So this is similar to the logic behind the Morse code. A and E in Morse are only one symbol because those are the most common let, uh, letters in the English alphabet. Similarly, when you have a population of neurons that encode something that is extremely frequent, it would do it with less spikes. It's a very simple uh, coding argument. Uh, now the funny thing is that even though you get less spikes, you can still get a better encoding in the sense that all your spikes happen together and if you happen to have read any of those papers on communication by synchrony, you would basically have that, you know, having your whole population firing at once is a way to make sure that the signal gets across, even though you may be using less spikes to do so. So basically, theoretically, you could have a better code just by having STDP improve your code, et cetera, et cetera. But the nice thing is that this also gives you predictions. Now imagine that I have like lightning and thunder. I have my visual cortex and my auditory cortex. Lightning comes, visual cortex uh, starts, uh, starts um, firing, and then thunder comes and auditory cortex starts firing. Now if there's any connection from the visual to the auditory, this connection would get reinforced. And therefore, I could have some neurons in the auditory cortex that will start firing upon getting the firing from the, from the auditory cortex. 
um, basically giving me predictions. And this allows me to make a wild speculation to say that maybe synaptic plasticity is something that appeared as a coding mechanism, which makes kind of a lot of sense. I mean, we can, I mean it was, the STDP kernel was proposed as a, um, as a temporal code for the burnout, so that's kind of where it belongs. But it turns out that if you play with it and if you put it in enough uh, neurons, you would get something that is much more than coding, that's actually cognitive, that's the notion of predictions. Um, so that, I, maybe I went fast, but basically um, the talk is, the idea is very simple. You have postsynaptic spikes, and if these, these come from a relatively regular spike train, the postsynaptic spike move forward in time. When they do so, they kind of improve the code by making it, uh, by giving less uh, spikes to the most common uh, words and making them like more reliable somehow. Uh, and it can also, Nicely enough, it can lead to predictions. Now, the um, obvious problem here is that I'm in a mathematics institute. We stay as far away from the real world as we can, and now will be the time to actually check whether this is something that happens in real world data. Um, nicely enough, I have a master's student who's gonna be looking into it, um, but I still don't have a data set, so if any of you has any suggestions or idea, please talk to me. My mini would appreciate it. Um, also, a couple of things. Basically, the idea that things should just happen as fast as possible within having some evidence, that's actually not restricted to neuroscience. Like, like you could imagine that in the stock market, people will be looking for early signals of anything rather than, um, yeah. So basically, we would be looking wherever we can find point processes that have kind of a speed at phenomena. Um, we'll try to look into that. And finally, um, see what happens when you have recurring neural networks because, well, then you could easily end up in this kind of idea that the network kind of continuously try to predict itself and then end up in a degenerated state. Um, so that's all. Um,